This is the Cato Daily Podcast for Wednesday, February 3rd, 2021. I'm Caleb Brown. The struggle for civil liberties in the wake of that deadly attack on the U.S. Capitol may be less certain now. And companies like Clearview AI are ready to help track down perpetrators with facial recognition technology. But when should law enforcement agencies feel free to use whatever new technology comes along? When should they seek permission rather than forgiveness? Cato's Matthew Feeney and Patrick Eddington comment. Clearview AI made uh, the news uh, last year in large part because of its controversial deployment of facial recognition in the context of law enforcement. Uh, Clearview AI uh, scours social media sites collecting uh, photos and basically acts as a search engine for people's faces. And this was obviously of interest to law enforcement, which is increasingly interested in using facial recognition technology. Uh, And after the uh, attempted insurrection at the Capitol building on January 6th, uh, there was a uptick in the use of Clearview AI among law enforcement. Uh, One of the more interesting features of the Capitol storming was how much the people involved were live streaming what they were doing or taking photos of what they were doing and deliberately uh, uploading a ton of data about their activities uh, to social media. And so it's not particularly surprising that law enforcement, while investigating these crimes, are using facial recognition. Pat, how does law enforcement make use of this kind of technology and what kind of hurdles exist before they're able to access vast databases of privately held uh, facial data? These are good times for uh, federal, state, and law enforcement when it comes to access to data. Um, if you look at Clearview, as, as Matthew was describing it, you know they, they've made their buck essentially by simply scraping images off of Twitter, YouTube, Venmo, I mean, you name it. Uh, and they claim to have, uh, and Matthew will correct me if I, my figure is wrong, but I think it's in excess of 3 billion uh, facial images in their database, which is, uh, you know, half the population of the planet. The last time I checked or pretty close to that. And there are essentially no real barriers to law enforcement. And, and of course we've seen, uh, and there was a recent piece that came out, uh, was, this was, I think the verge, unless I'm badly mistaken uh, on January 10th, uh, making note that, uh, Clearview had reported, uh, a 26% increase in the use of their technology by law enforcement uh, in the days after uh, the would-be insurrectionists did their thing on Capitol Hill. So there are no barriers there. Of course, Senator Ron Wyden, a Democrat of Oregon, senior member on the Senate Intelligence Committee, has got legislation out that is designed to basically uh, force law enforcement to effectively get warrants uh, to use this kind of technology. You know whether that's actually going to go anywhere right now. I, I tend to I tend to doubt it. Uh, I, I sense a strong level of general public support for what the FBI and their state and local law enforcement partners are doing. I think it's worth noting that as of January twenty eighth, uh, at least one hundred and forty eight would be insurrectionists have been charged. Uh, they're from thirty five different states, uh, and at least seventeen of those are women, uh, from what I can tell. That that number of women may be a little bit higher than that. But in any event. They're going to town with what they can get their hands on, which is actually quite a little bit. So what what may be a big concern, or at least is of some concern to me, is the idea that this event, uh, January 6th, this attack on the Capitol, will be viewed as a victory for facial recognition. And uh, in, in hailing that victory, I fear that uh, local prosecutors uh, and others will be given essentially a, a larger berth to make use of this technology uh, in bringing charges more broadly. I think it's fair to say that the um, the momentum against facial recognition was really beginning to kind of, uh, in some respects, pick up a lot of steam before this attack. You know, Oakland was one of the first uh, communities in the country to basically pass bans. And uh, Matt will have more to say about this in, in a moment, I'm sure. But there had been a number of localities that had begun to kind of move in the direction of either, you know, moratoriums, a pauses on the use of this stuff, or just outright bans. Uh, and I, I think you're completely spot on, Caleb. I think the political moment right now, at least, is such that uh, it's going to make it a whole lot easier for law enforcement to make the case, you know, essentially see, we told you so, 
uh, we really do need this stuff. The the worry I have is that the the climate uh, is is shifting. Um, as you know, we, we the three of us have discussed uh, facial recognition quite a few times, and in the last couple of years, of course, it was under the Trump administration, and a lot of the uh, concerns about facial recognition uh, at the time were grounded in concerns, especially about uh, the immigrant community about particular religious minorities. And that was a result, I think, because of the, the political climate we were in. And now, uh, in the wake of the, uh, the January 6th attack, uh, most of the facial recognition discussions will be in the context of right-wing extremism, militias, uh, conspiracy theorists who feel like they need to act on their convictions. Uh, and that, I think, is going to complicate things. Um, and so there is the political, cultural complication, but I think there's also... Uh, with facial recognition, a unique uh, or almost unique privacy complication, which is we are all familiar with uh, having private spaces, so our homes, and we understand that you know, thanks to jurisprudence and law, that uh, the the police need a, a warrant to get into a private space. Um, but we're in this weird stage in our in our culture and our society where we feel simultaneously very private about data that we are very public about. So we might take photos of our food or our uh, birthday parties of our nieces and nephews, and we'll upload them to Facebook uh, for our friends and everyone else to see. But once we hear that the local cops are scouring that information in order to identify you because you showed up to a protest, we get this instinctual kind of creepiness about it. Uh, and that's a difficult thing for uh, I think lawmakers to navigate here because uh, I can imagine the police will make the uh, the argument. Well, you can't possibly say that you are expecting privacy out of this information. You're deliberately putting it out there. <laughs> and in the case of the January sixth Capitol attack, I mean, the argument there is especially weak for the insurrectionists to make a privacy claim. They were in one of the most recorded environments in the country, uploading their activities to these sites. So. Uh, that, that those are just a couple of complications I would like to highlight in the current discussion. When law enforcement uses uh, technology, be it uh, Stingray, uh, to gather information that that they then use to to bring charges, a lot of these technologies, uh, prosecutors will go to some pains to obscure. Uh, that is, they will engage in a process of uh, what they call parallel reconstruction. That is, we've judges don't really like or, or uh, in a way that is uh, at least in not uh, maybe 100 percent legal for us to be uh, gathering information in this way. So we have to recreate the manner in which we uh, gathered this data. Is that a risk here? It's an interesting question. I mean, with with facial recognition, there is quite frankly, especially at the federal level, so little uh, governing it that I don't think it will ne be necessary uh, would be my my take on it. This is an area where lawmakers are going to have to do most of the work. Are those looking to courts, I think, will be left disappointed. Uh, the Supreme Court jurisprudence here is uh, to say um, unhelpful would be an understatement. Uh, but you have seen, as Pat alluded to, uh, jurisdictions across the country have improved upon the floor that the Supreme Court has laid. Uh, it is a you know, local state uh, authorities have taken steps on drones, on facial recognition. Uh, but with, with January 6th in particular, we're talking about federal property and um, the federal government on many of these issues has uh, not been as active as uh, many state level lawmakers have been. So here's where I would really, you know, think that we need to maybe draw some distinctions about um, what's appropriate with respect to parallel construction and maybe what's not. And I'm going to use a historical example here, a very prominent one, and that's the case of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. The reason that the U.S. government knew that they were Soviet agents who were responsible for uh, providing uh, nuclear secrets to the Soviets was that uh, the U.S. Army and U.S. Uh, intelligence had at least partially cracked the Soviet Venona Code. And that is what gave them the confidence to know up front that they were pretty much right. Now, what they did not want to do was reveal that. So they went about a process, essentially, of continuing the investigation until they managed to get somebody else to crack. Uh, and that person essentially, you know, put them on the pathway of being able to finally go forward with the case without ever having to reveal uh, that they got their initial tip uh, from Venona. So I, I will say that where we're talking about 
extremely perishable national intelligence capabilities and assets, I think the issue of parallel construction gets you know, a little bit more complicated. When we talk about domestic law enforcement, that's where I think it's not complicated. I, I think if they're basically trying to cover their tracks from having used a technique or a capability uh, for which they did not have probable cause, for which they did not have you know, legitimate legal authority to act, that's a different animal. But when we start talking about foreign intelligence and, and trying to essentially use that technology to uncover potential uh, bad actors here or bad actors that overseas that are in contact with folks here, um, I think we have to maybe take a, a little bit more nuanced approach to it. I still believe that the principle of probable cause and individualized suspicion should govern everything, right? Including, including anytime you're talking about the use of FISA or maybe even other technologies that we're not aware of. Uh, but I, I do think it gets a little bit more complicated when we talk about it in kind of a foreign and foreign intelligence context, but in a domestic law enforcement context, as far as I'm concerned, no. Police agencies in, in many cases feel free to act where there is no law prohibiting their behavior. Uh, and when it comes to gathering uh, data about people who may or may not have committed a crime, um, they seem especially free. Is, is that, you know, how should states in, in terms of trying to understand the ways in which police agencies that are under their control are acting, how should they think about uh, the authorities that law enforcement agencies otherwise might presume? I, I've written before on the Cato blog about the emergence of surveillance technologies and how local officials should deal with this, because it oftentimes is a, a surprise to local populations that their police have been using these new technologies without uh, without their knowledge. And it's regrettable that it, it seems that some, some police uh, around the country use a uh, don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness down the line, and that if something new, a new toy comes along, feel free to use it. And I, I've written before that I, I think police should not be able to use a new surveillance tool without announcing at least six months before planned deployment. Uh, they need to be public about it. There need to be hearings with members of the community. Uh, certain very specific questions need to be asked about civil liberty protections and the planned use of deployments. And I, I think that this kind of conversation is very important when the cost of a lot of very intrusive surveillance technology seems to be decreasing by the day. Uh, the, you know, for example, uh, drones that could be very, very invasive in police hands are very cheap for local law enforcement. Uh, you know, aerial surveillance with traditional helicopters and airplanes is pretty expensive, but you can buy a pretty good drone for only a few hundred dollars or a few thousand. Similarly, with things like uh, Clearview AI, it's, it's becoming increasingly cheap. Uh, for police to conduct pretty invasive searches on public information. So I think that that's a, a, an argument, I think, in favor of increased transparency. Uh, I, at, at the very least, I would like to uh, I would like to see police departments announcing new toys and gadgets and tools uh, months before they actually deploy them. I do think that the public deserves to know uh, what that police are up to. I think what Matt has described uh, ought to be kind of the forward leaning way that activists approach this you know so in other words um rather than wait to find out that your local police department you know has got this stuff and is using it without any kind of oversight or whatever uh if if i were running an activist organization i would be working over my local official city council uh etc either through direct meetings freedom of information etc in order to find out what the cops are up to and then i would be utilizing uh, you know, model ordinances essentially to, to basically require the very kinds of things that Matthew is talking about, because, you know, we know the history of this stuff, right? It winds up getting used. Uh, it gets abused. We've already seen multiple examples of, of, uh, wrong facial recognition, generally targeting people of color. People of color tend to be the victims of this because of the algorithms. And then you wind up having, you know, all of this damage that you have to try to undo on the back end. And you wind up with this big fight. Um, if you want to avoid that, it seems to me that you get out in front of the problem from the very beginning. You recognize that technology is almost always going to run out in front of law and policymaking, and you have to basically get inside that cycle, get out in front of it in order to really have a chance of dealing with it. 
Patrick Eddington is a research fellow at the Cato Institute. Matthew Feeney directs Cato's project on emerging technologies. Subscribe to the Cato Daily Podcast anywhere you please and follow us on Twitter at Cato Podcast.